when you should get pregnant is a decision that's up to you, but you can get fertility testing done at any time if you're curious about your reproductive health. It's really important though to understand that no test is going to tell us that you are fertile and can get pregnant. The entire point of fertility testing is for us to have an earlier identification of factors that might be preventing you from getting pregnant. This is a huge difference in our mindset because I often see patients say, well, I had that tested years ago and it was fine, so I know that I'm fertile. Very important for you to understand, that's not exactly the case. What we're looking for is who needs earlier intervention or who might need help on their journey to parenthood. So first of all, when should you get testing? If you're trying to get pregnant and you're not having success, there are some guidelines about when you should get fertility testing. If you're under age 35 and you've been trying to get pregnant for one year, you should schedule a consultation with a fertility doctor. If you're between 35 and 40 and you've been trying to get pregnant for six months, then you should schedule a consultation. And honestly, if you're 40 and over, my recommendation is that you just schedule a consult right away. There's no reason to try for any set amount of time. You really want that data in your hand so that if there's a problem, we can intervene and take action a lot sooner in this journey. However, if there's anything abnormal or you're concerned about, you should go sooner than those timelines. Number one problem that I see with patients is an irregular or an abnormal cycle. Understanding your period cycle is key to getting pregnant, and if your period is not coming at a regular predictable interval, you do not need to wait any set amount of time before you come in and you have testing done. This means go ahead and call the office, get a consultation right away. You also don't have to wait for those time periods. So if you have really heavy or painful periods, if you've had pregnancy losses in the past, if you know you have endometriosis or PCOS and you want to get an evaluation sooner, you absolutely can. I also see patients who are waiting to schedule a visit until their gynecologist brings this up to them, thinking, well, if my OBGYN's not bringing it up, everything must be fine. And the truth is, that's not always the case. Your gynecologist is there for preventive health, to make sure you're up to date on your pap smears, to talk about contraception. And unless you are bringing up your family planning journey, you can't guarantee that they are going to. This means that you have to advocate for yourself and know what's important for you along the way. When it comes to testing, you don't need a referral. Your doctor can send one, but you can just call my office or any fertility office and say, I'd like to have fertility testing done and we will schedule you. I think it's really important to understand what you're gonna do with the information. And you know I always ask, what's your goal? Because that's paramount to us doing the correct testing and being able to interpret and process that data the best. But you've heard me say it before, you can't make decisions on data you don't know, and I'm a huge fan of early testing, and if our worst case scenario is all the test is normal and you decide to try on your own a little bit longer, you can at least do it with peace of mind that there's nothing else preventing you. When it comes to testing, let's go through evaluation of both male and female partners. So for the male partner, it's pretty straightforward. You're gonna have a semen analysis. With a semen analysis, what we're looking for is to get a full evaluation of the sperm. This is going to include the volume of the sample, the concentration of the sperm, the motility of the sperm, and the morphology or the shape of the sperm. The semen analysis is also going to give us information on the pH of the sample, if there's any immature cells or white blood cells. So there is some additional information gained from that sperm sample. But this is the first line test for the male partner. It actually tells us a lot about male hormones because sperm and testosterone are made at the same time. So if your testosterone is low, your sperm count is going to be low. This brings up one really important side note is that taking testosterone for men is essentially male birth control. It tells the brain to stop sending out the hormone signals that make testosterone and sperm, therefore, not making sperm. So it's really essential that if you're trying to get pregnant or you wanna be pregnant in the future, that the male partner is not on testosterone therapy. This doesn't mean that low testosterone is not a problem because of course it can be, but there are other safe medication options that will help you boost production of testosterone that do not harm sperm production. When it comes to female factors, there's a lot more that we have to test, unfortunately. So in general, what we're looking for is number one, a really thorough medical history to see if you are ovulating. And what's the best sign that you're ovulating? 
this is going to be a regular predictable period. And so we're going to get into the nitty gritty. How far apart are your cycles? How long do they last? Are you tracking ovulation? What are you using? When is it coming? This means you know right away, I'm going to ask those questions. So open up your phone or your cycle tracking app or your calendar and pay attention to the data it's giving you. That way you have it readily available when I'm asking these questions. Number two, if I'm unsure if you're ovulating regularly, if you're not sure if your period is regular, there is testing we can do to confirm ovulation. This is typically going to be done with a luteal progesterone level. Remember that progesterone is made from the corpus luteum after you have ovulated. It's made in pulses, so progesterone is not telling us about the quality of the luteal phase. It's just telling us if you did or you did not ovulate. But it can confirm ovulation if you're unsure if your tracking is accurate. From there, in almost all patients, we're going to draw a blood test called an AMH. AMH is anti-malarian hormone, and it's a marker of your ovarian reserve. Ovarian reserve is a fancy way of saying how many eggs that you have remaining. My analogy for this is to imagine that there is a vault inside your ovary, and when you're born, that vault is full. You have all the eggs you're ever going to have. Every single month, you have a group of eggs coming out of this vault, and each egg grows inside a small fluid-filled structure called a follicle. Well, around the follicles are cells that make AMH. In one given month, you're going to have one of these follicles or eggs grow, mature, and ovulate, and the rest of them are going to die. But what's really fascinating is that when you have more eggs in the vault, typically when you're younger, you're going to have more eggs coming out of the vault every month. And when you have less eggs in the vault, you're going to have less coming out every month. So the eggs outside the vault are a surrogate marker representing how many eggs you have remaining. So AMH made from the eggs outside the vault is also representing how many you have. To put it simply, more eggs remaining, more AMH. Fewer eggs, lower AMH. AMH is just a blood test and it's not perfect. It is going to fluctuate a little bit month to month because our body is not perfect. You will have a different number of eggs sent out from that vault every single month but we're looking at the average to get an idea if you're at your age-related norm or if you might have more or less eggs for your age. Importantly, AMH is not telling us if you're fertile or if you're infertile. Because if we think about it, if you have five eggs outside the vault or 20, as long as you're still ovulating, you're ovulating one egg. So you have the exact same chance of getting pregnant as somebody who might have a higher or lower AMH. However, you will have a shorter reproductive lifespan. You'll go into menopause earlier, and this severely could impact your reproductive goals and your timeline. In addition, women with a lower AMH are going to get fewer eggs per cycle of egg freezing or IVF. Because when we do those treatments, what we're trying to do is get all of the eggs outside the vault to grow. And I can only make grow what is there. However, AMH is really insightful to us. And one question I always ask is, if yours is low, why? There might be some common causes that can contribute to having a low AMH that also do cause infertility. Examples include smoking or endometriosis. So it's not quite as simple as saying, oh, AMH doesn't impact your fertility, but it might not prevent you from getting pregnant and it might not be the cause of infertility if you are having trouble. In addition to the AMH, we like to do an ultrasound determination of your follicles. This is called an AFC antral follicle count. Honestly, what we're doing is we're looking with vaginal ultrasound so that we can count the small follicles that are outside the vault. We can actually see them. This number also fluctuates month to month, but it's giving us an idea between your AMH and your antral follicle count where you are on this reproductive timeline. And I think that's really important and insightful information so that you can make the decisions that are right for you. <music> 